to Howard and the telephone vote. Now, he's been looking at the technical revolution that's made it all possible. 20 years ago, telephone exchanges looked and sounded like this. Every digit dialed on the telephone moves contacts up and around until the right connection is made. Well, these electromechanical systems work remarkably well, but making a connection is only as fast as the speed of the mechanism. And in an exchange like this, it can take at least 10 seconds to connect your call. But this new digital exchange will connect you in milliseconds. There are no moving parts, just lots of microchips which switch and route the calls. And more than 75% of trunk calls use this system, and many local exchanges are being converted. But digital exchanges can also provide information about the vastly increased numbers of calls, and the network managers can keep an eye on the traffic and make actions, take actions if an overload looks likely. Well, on the map behind me, we can see all the regional digital centers around the country. Down here, for instance, is Plymouth. Plymouth and all the rest also appear on this more schematic diagram. Plymouth again down here. Here's our London exchange we're using, North Paddington. And way up the top there, the red blob EH is Edinburgh. And those lines represent the traffic between the exchanges. They are actually the 20 uh, lines with the heaviest uh, business on them at the moment. Now, what we're looking at here, and this is a, a exactly at this point where the if a sudden surge happened in calls, then the network managers could uh, take some action against it. Now, this information is updated every 15 minutes, so what we're actually looking at is what happened before 6.30, before we put out the information about the calls. So if we now look at the current situation, <laughs> look at that incredible change, all those lines now coming into our North Paddington. In fact, that's 6.30 to 6.45, and we did say don't call in until after that, and I happen to know that 24,500 uh, people called in at the wrong time, thanks a lot. Now, the process uh, of displaying the, the information up there takes 11 minutes, so uh, we're going to have to wait just for a second to see the information that we're interested in, what's happened between 6.45 and 7 o'clock. Now, this map up here also appears on the console of the network managers. And if we get over there just in time, we'll be able to see that map change. There's the network system there. And over on the right, it's just changed, I believe. And you can see that a lot of people are still ringing in in the, uh, that quarter of an hour period. Now, the network manager can also focus in onto, into any of the digital exchanges around the country. And Peter here has got the North uh, Paddington, the London exchange, up. And look at the calls. There they are going to our yes, no uh, numbers there, the red and green lines. Over on this side, we can actually see the details. Here's the yes line and uh, the numbers there coming in. There's no, and we can see 40,012. We're not sure about the yes. Now, these, of course, represent only a fraction of the calls coming in from around the country, because if they were all let through, the London Exchange would be overloaded, and other people trying to use the exchange wouldn't be able to do so. So what happens is the uh, network managers um, know about a phone in advance, and they can uh, make the changes, they can put in uh, blocks, if you like, because further up the lines here in the regional centres, they'll put blocks in that only allow so many of the calls down through to uh, London. And that's so that the blocks can maximise the number of calls down to the target number and minimise the disruption to other people trying to use that exchange. Well, let's have a look at the uh, results of the Tomorrow's World poll. We've seen how many uh, got down to uh, London. Um, we can see yes now up there is 2,794 and no as 552. But uh, as I said, this exchange has been protected by those blocks in the regional centres and they've held back a lot of the calls. But those calls can be actually counted by the computer. And I think, Jeff, you're having a look at Edinburgh, aren't you? Yes, Howard. We've got a pretty even split here. I've got 2,779 yes and 2,774 no. Oh, so undecided up in Edinburgh. What about Bristol and the South West? Well, Bristol were the ones that you pointed to there, 2,794 yes and 552 no. I thought they'd changed, so very much in favour down in the southwest. What about another uh, north one? We can go up to Manchester, right. can't we, Jeff? I'm just calling up Manchester. I'll tell you the figures in just a few moments. It's a bit slow. 
we would expect <coughs> Manchester to perhaps be a little more ambivalent about it, wouldn't we? Well, never mind. Is it there? Not quite. No, OK. Well, the hardest task <coughs> of all is Danny on the end, because he's had to count up the total from all the regional exchanges around the country. So have we got a, a final answer? Uh, we've got a final answer for the period between 6.45 and 7 o'clock. For the yes vote, it was 271,132. And for the no, it was 86... Eight, 86,712. All right, so we seem to be very much in favour in British summertime all the year round. Now, to our knowledge, is that the, the greatest number of calls in a 15 minute period to one number? It certainly is, Howard. Okay, well, thank you to everybody who uh, called in and helped to test the, the world's largest network management system. It's, uh, it's still working, which is good news for comic relief in 10 days' time, and we'll pass on your attitudes about British summertime to the, uh, to the right people. Well, now, Judith. Thank you very much, Howard. In all the recent concern about food safety, a lot of attention has been focused on microwave ovens. Are they safe? Well, there's no doubt that they can heat food hot enough to kill bacteria like Listeria. But the problem is they can also leave cold spots. I'm going to put this very hot pizza in front of this thermal camera. There it is. And you can see that it's very different around the edge. White with a little red because it's very, very hot. And then you've got the green areas, which are much colder. Though there is a red spot in the middle. That's probably a tomato. And I'll explain why that makes it hotter in the centre in a minute. Now, one reason why cold spots occur is the shape of the food. Microwaves don't pass far into the food. And it takes time for heat to spread from the outside in. The second factor is what the food is made of particularly how moist it is, hence the tomato. Microwaves themselves aren't hot. They're similar to radio waves and they're only converted to heat by the molecules in food. Watery food is better at this conversion, which is why it's so easy to burn your mouth on the filling of a microwave pie. But there is another reason why foods don't cook evenly. In the oven itself, some spots become much hotter than others. As you'll see, if I put this tray of now very liquid egg white, into here and switch it on. Our graphics show how microwaves enter the cavity from here and then bounce around the oven, sometimes adding energy but sometimes cancelling each other out. Normally turntables or rotating reflectors are fitted to even out the effects of the heat and avoid cold spots. But in here we switched the turntable off. And the result, as you can see, uneven cooking. But the situation is even more complicated because the food itself moves the cold spots, something that's demonstrated by new research at Nottingham University using these computer models. This is the oven empty. And here are the hot spots with cold spots in between, which move when a sponge pudding is added, as do the cold spots, as you've seen. And the waves pass more slowly through the sponge, which alters where that heat builds up. And different types of food affect the cold spots differently. So microwave manufacturers can't design ovens to smooth out all the effects. Though it is hoped that this research will lead to better designs. But perhaps the ultimate answer to dangerous cold spots is this, designer microwave food. One large company is now testing pies like this, shaped like donuts, to eliminate those tricky to reach centres. And they're also considering pockets of sauces strategically placed to help heat the middle of dishes. For now, the best advice is to microwave food for at least the recommended time, then leave it standing to let the heat spread and make sure it's piping hot, even in the middle. And if you don't like the shape of things to come, what about home cooking? Peter. <coughs> Well, that should do for a sample there. You know, every vehicle on the road, even this monster, needs one part of the engine regularly changed, and that is the oil. Sludge and metal, even water and antifreeze that leaks into there, can all contaminate the oil and spoil its performance. And that's why oil changes are recommended every 6,000 or 12,000 miles. But these standard distances are deceptive. The amount of punishment your engine gives the oil can vary. The trouble is you can't tell just by looking at it how many miles it has left. It doesn't take long for a sump oil to look as mucky as this. But uh, here's a little device which could give you an instant idea of just how contaminated your oil is. At the bottom of this well here are two tiny spirals of copper that measure an electrical property of liquid called its dielectric constant. 
Now this constant in fresh clean oil is very low and we've already calibrated this instrument with a sample of clean oil. This device will now compare any further tests against that reading. So if I take some of that out of there, just wipe the gunge off the end there and put it into this well here. Now any metal particles or other contaminants in there will alter the electrical properties of the sample and this is picked up by the device and shown as a reading on this scale. So let's take that reading here and if that reading does go into the red then uh, the oil really needs changing. If it stays in the green then we're okay. Now if you can look on that there you can just see that the reading is in fact just well into the green just at that point there. So judging from this I think this oil has a good few miles still left in it. In the latest edition of the science magazine Nature, researchers report that the nose could provide important insights into Alzheimer's disease, the commonest cause of senile dementia. At the moment, no one knows what causes Alzheimer's, and it can only be diagnosed for certain after death by taking sections of brain and looking for characteristic tangles and plaques. A few years ago, it was noticed that sufferers from this disease often lost their sense of smell. And when scientists examined nerve cells at the back of the nose from patients who had died of the disease, they found the same sort of tangles and plaques. So it may soon be possible to check for Alzheimer's by taking a small sample of living tissue from the nose, which would then help researchers pinpoint the causes of this disease. And nasal nerve cells could also help find a treatment. They're the only nerve cells which come from the brain that continuously regenerate. So for the first time, it may be possible to study Alzheimer's in tissue samples grown in the lab, which would dramatically speed up research into a cure. At this week's Nordic Ski Championships, an unusual form of blood testing has been going on. For the first time, competitors have been tested to see if they have been blood boosting, that is, pumping extra red blood cells into their bodies prior to an event to add to their endurance ability. Red blood cells carry oxygen, and studies have shown that blood boosting can give endurance gains of about 5%, which can be the difference between 1st and 10th place. The International Olympic Committee outlawed the practice in 1986 after the American Olympic Committee admitted that seven members of their cycling team at the 1984 Olympics did just this, including one gold medal winner. But it's still thought to be the commonest form of cheating in sports like cross-country skiing and long-distance running. The new tests can detect both of the methods used for blood boosting. Some athletes have their own blood taken weeks before the race and then keep it frozen. The body compensates by producing more young red cells. Just before the race, the old red cells are added back again. This cheating can be picked up by detecting an abnormal number of new cells. Alternatively, athletes use someone else's blood. This is detected by looking for foreign red cells. Now, this sort of testing is still at a very early stage, but athletes and officials are saying it's a big step forward. Designs of a new concept vehicle have recently been revealed, and this one's destined for the moon. Unlike the dune buggy that American astronauts drove on the moon in the early 70s, the new lunar vehicles would be remotely controlled from Earth. But they'd have a limited ability to react independently to their surroundings with robotic arms to do repetitive tasks. They're intended as construction vehicles for a radio telescope NASA proposes building on the dark side of the moon, where it would be shielded by the moon from man-made radio interference. Building it would take two years, and work, if it's to go ahead, would start early in the next century. A Californian biologist has recently patented a way of keeping worms in suspended animation and then bringing them back to life again. The tiny parasitic nematode worms are used in pest control. They track down and kill the larval stages of crop-eating insects. Several US labs have been breeding the worms, but the problem has always been how to transport them in large numbers. When packed together, they die. The solution? Remove 90% of their body water by osmosis. In this state, the worms can survive for over a month, so they can be packed up and taken to wherever they're needed. Then just add water, stir, and a few minutes later, the worms are as good as new.